Rafa for uh, joining us. Um, I know when it's uh, the last session of the day and the weather has finally turned around this week, um, I appreciate you taking that time to spend with me. Uh, so I do want to talk to you a little bit today about assistive technology and the importance of it and how it can be used and it really is throughout the lifespan that assistive technology is very important. Um, I, as Carrie said, my name is Jesse Wright, and I am the director of Main Site, so that's the State Assistive Technology Program. I'll talk to you a little bit about the end about the program and the resources that it provides to you. Um, but before we go into that, I want to make sure you have a full understanding of assistive technology and the entire world that it opens up. So we're just going to jump right into that. Okay. Maybe. So if you don't know what assistive technology is, it is any device or service that helps a person with a disability that would do something that would otherwise be difficult or impossible. So when you really think about that, that's very, very broad. Uh, it's anything. And it took me a long time, even as a person in this profession, to figure out what the service part is, um, because we tend to think of assistive technology as the devices, but it's not just the device. Uh, so this really hit home to me finally this summer. Um, I was working with my mom, she has severe arthritis and she needed a flower sifter. And so we were looking at different flower sifters and a lot of them have the handles that you squeeze. And I realized that that would not work so well for her. She doesn't always have a good grip due to her arthritis. So we should look at one that had um, the wheel that you turn. Uh, so that's the service part of that. It's sometimes it's not necessarily about finding some great, crazy adapted device. Sometimes it's about having the service and having someone help you choose an off the shelf device that meets your individualized needs. And that's really what assistive technology is. It's finding what you as an individual want to be able to do, and then figuring out what bridge, what tools, what service um, we need to provide to get you to the other side so that you can do those things. And there are so many things that you can do with assistive technology. It really does open the doors to um, pretty much anything. Um, so here on the screen, for example, I have a picture of a sneaker with elastic shoelaces. If you did not have the fine motor skills or even the appendages to tie your shoes, you can still put your shoes on independently using elastic laces or maybe using Velcro uh, on your sneakers. Now that's something that's off the shelf now. Um, now uh, the laces that are shown here are ones that you would buy and put it in your tennis shoe. But now we have a ton of shoes out there that come with elastic laces. It's just part of mainstream life now. And this is where we're starting to see a lot of uh, assistive technology really become a part of mainstream life and people not realize, realizing um, that we're, what they're using are things that we have been using to adapt things for years. Uh, the other picture here is an individual using uh, an eye gaze communication device. So right there in two different pictures, we see the wide spectrum of assistive technology, low tech, you know, just putting your shoes on, um, off the, you know, off the shelf technology, you can get at the dollar store and then a, you know, probably uh, about a $16,000 communication device uh, that is high tech and complex. Uh, so it really does cover all avenues of life uh, and come in, you know, a wide range from low tech or no tech technology to high tech and complicated technologies. Um, and it's, you know, who are our AT users? Well, here, you know, in these pictures, we have an individual who's getting dressed using adapted technology, um, someone who's on an adapted bicycle, who's, um, you know, in their later stages of life. And then we have a young child uh, using an iPad while sitting on a wobble seat. So as you can see, it really is across the lifespan. Uh, we have assistive technology users and it can be, again, something very, very simple that we don't think of like this wobble seat. Uh, we see these things in preschools and elementary schools, and we don't think a lot about them. But when you start looking at yoga um, devices and things, you'll find um, cushions that you can put on your office chair that we say are for core stability, but it's also great for folks who have attention issues and are always, you know, always wiggling around in their seat. It gives them that ability to have that motion uh, without being super distracting to everyone around them, and it makes it look appropriate. 
the ones we see on the screen have, you know, texture to them and they're fun colors because of the audience. But the truth is, if you turn that gray, it looks just like the one that is offered by the yoga place um, that you would use in your office chair. So a lot of the things that we um, are looking at are really um, generational uh, or in intergenerational. They're just across the lifespan. And one of the things I like to remind people too, is so in this first picture, we have an individual who's pulling his pants up using this adaptive device. That adaptive device looks like a pair of suspenders. While it is actually a specific device for getting dressed, it is basically a pair of suspenders. So when I work with people, I always try to encourage them to, you know, when we find devices that work for you, is there a low tech option we can find? Is there an adapted way that we can do this more affordably? Because if I buy the dressing aid that is labeled dressing aid for individuals with disabilities, we're going to pay you know, five to 10 times more than if I just went somewhere and bought a pair of suspenders to do the same thing. So we really try to look at cost savings with assistive technology as well, because we realize that if you need that dressing aid now, you might need that for your whole life. And if it costs $50, $100, you know, maybe that's not a big deal to some people, but for some people that, you know, is a big part of their monthly income. And if you have to buy that repeatedly throughout your life, you know, if we can find an option that is, you know, much cheaper, you know, a pair of suspenders from again, you know, Walmart, the dollar store that you can have easy access to anytime you need them. Um, it's just right down the street. It's a much more affordable option and much easier to access. Um, so our AT users are across the lifespan and we want to make sure that, you know, we're meeting people where they are. So if we have a person like the person on the bike who is you know, ready to embrace you know, an adapted bicycle and getting out there, um, then great, that's where we're going to meet them. But if their version of an adapted activity is something a little bit you know, less adapted looking and they have to ease their way into it, that's where we start with them. Sorry. Um, we really just want to meet people where they are and, and get them used to assistive technology before we overwhelm them. Um, and when we even use the term assistive technology, I often have people who just start to backpedal like, oh, no, 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 no. That sounds really complicated and way over my head, um, especially when we start talking to uh, parents who are overwhelmed already with everything that they're having to deal with or our uh, aging population. So you know, just even changing the language to assistive tools or uh, devices to make your life easier, to be more independent. So changing the language can really help our AT users um, adapt to using the technology uh, and just be more open to it. So we, again, it's a very person-centered approach when we talk about assistive technology. Um, with every person we talk to, we have to make sure that we're explaining it in a manner that they understand. Um, I know I was at a, a developmental disability conference and uh, I was working with a gentleman and I was giving AT away. I had all kinds of stuff uh, at the time that I could just give away and I had grabbers so or reachers. So you, you can find those absolutely anywhere. You know, they're little devices where you can, you know, while you're sitting in a chair, pick up, a, you know, uh, the towel that dropped or I use them myself when things fall in beside the dryer and I need to reach down and grab something. Well, I had these available and this was a gentleman in a wheelchair and he said he did not want to use that because it made him look more disabled. So I had to come back and really think about how was I, you know, communicating with him about what this could do for him. Um, I noticed that he was surrounded by young ladies who were there to help you know, cater to him that week and, and get him through the conference. Um, so I got the reacher and I grabbed a girl by the the, the wrist with it. And I brought her over and I said, well, look at this. <laughs> now we've just brought you over a dance partner. That was all it took for him to be like, I, I'll take this. And suddenly he was Mr. Social at this conference, walking around, grabbing people and bringing over a conversation partner. It was simply showing him how something could be used for him in a fun way um, that then later he could adapt to being a useful and meaningful way in other activities as well. So really, we just want to meet people where they are and have those conversations um, to make sure our AT users 
are comfortable with AT and want to continue using AT because if we don't, our AT users tend to be non-AT users. Uh, we get them equipment and it goes and sits in a closet because they're not comfortable with it. We didn't talk to them about it. We didn't explain to them the uses of it and try to make sure we were making it a person-centered approach. So where can AT be used? Absolutely everywhere. Um, it's not just in a classroom that we use AT. It is not just um, at work. Um, you know, it is used across your lifespan and in every environment. And this hits really hard for me when I talk about communication. Uh, when we have someone who has a communication device and that is their voice, um, it should be with them all the time. And I know we run into a lot of problems with that when we talk, you know, the K-12 sector um, and someone is using communication at school and maybe it is that $10,000 or $16,000 eye gaze communication system. Well, they're not comfortable with them bringing it home. You know, it's you know, too easily broken. We're concerned about this and that, or maybe they can't take it home for the summer. This is a problem. I, that's your voice. I'm sorry, but if I take your voice out and I sit it over here on the shelf for the summer um, so that you can come back in the fall and pick it up, how wonderful are you going to feel about that? Uh, you know, all this time I'm spent with you trying to teach you how to use a voice and communicate appropriately and ask for things and teaching you the value of that voice. And now I'm sitting it over here saying you can't have it during these time periods. Uh, and I have worked in school systems where, you know, even when we did send the device home, there would be places within the school that they wouldn't want the device to go. Um, yeah, you know, we're going to gym, so we can't take the device oh, you know, this person's not going to need to ask for help in the gym, or what if they need to go to the bathroom? Or heaven forbid, they get hit with something and they can't tell you where something hurts. Um, your voice goes with you everywhere. Uh, it's just like my voice goes with me everywhere. So when we're talking about where our assistive technology is used, uh, you, obviously there are places that you don't take everything. I use an adapted mouse. I don't need to take that with me if I go out to eat not going to be on a computer, but other items that, you know, are useful in those environments, we should be considering taking those out. Uh, we should not limit our AT use to um, places where other people think it's appropriate. Uh, it really is about the individual and where they need to be using that device. Um, I've had a lot of folks who do the transition from K-12 into higher ed or employment, and they were able to use those devices in school, but you know, how do we use that now that we're in other settings? Well, that's where we really need to make those dis have those discussions about transitioning with assistive technology and making sure that if you've been using text to speech to read books your entire learning career, when you get out of school, you have access to that as well. Um, you're not going to be able to fill out the job application if you can't read it. So we want to make sure that you know people understand that assistive technology doesn't have to fit in a box in this room, that it can be mobile, it can be um, you know, universally used in different places depending on the needs for that assistive technology. Uh, a good example of that too is, is vision devices. Um, we had, you know, prior to all of the newer technology um, with the tablets and the smartphones, we had a thousand different devices for folks who had vision impairments. You had the color reader, um, you had you know, the trekker breeze that'll tell you which direction to go. And you had um, maybe a, um, another device that'll OCR and, and read a menu to you or a magnifier. Well, you weren't taking all of that stuff with you everywhere. If you hooked all of that to your tool belt, your pants would fall down. So now we get it all in a little tiny box where all these apps can do these things and you really do have a much more portable system. So when we're looking at um, our AT, we talk to our users uh, and then we wanna find out where they're gonna be so that we can make sure that AT can go with them wherever it needs to go. Uh, so if we've got a, a little four-year-old and we're talking communication system, it needs to be portable or someone needs to be taking it, you know, carrying it for them. So we want to make sure that whatever we're looking at, it can definitely um, fit the needs of those users. So examples of this, so AT for home, and I, 
I have a lot of pictures and I do a lot of conversation because AT is so broad. I could talk to you for a week and I would still not cover it all. Um, there's just so much out there. I feel like I work in a toy box and I get to play all day and I get to help people do things they couldn't do before. There's no better job than an AT specialist. Um, so I want to just kind of expand your AT knowledge into some different areas of life. So one of the areas you can use AT is at home um, for simple things, just like eating. There are scoop plates for folks who maybe don't have the fine motor skills um, to get their food up onto their fork or their spoon uh, so that they can not have to chase it around the plate all day. And right there, you also have a cuff for someone who maybe can't grasp their fork. Uh, so making sure we can be independent in eating. If you are an independent eater, let's stop and think there what it would feel like if you had to wait for someone to feed you all the time. You know, while there are people who do it, and one of my best friends is one of those people who has to do it because she has SMA, um, she would love to have the ability to do it herself. And providing that ability for a lot of folks isn't that hard if we just know that the technology exists and it's out there. Um, so a lot of you know, assistive technology work is just raising the awareness because people don't know what's out there. Just like the second image here is one of my absolute favorite pieces of assistive technology it is a poor assist. Because I can tell you when I pick up a gallon of milk, I'm guaranteed to spill it everywhere. Um, what this does is allows you to put the gallon of milk or the two liter of soda or the um, pitcher of water into this device and it has a controlled pour uh, versus gravity just taking over and liquid flying everywhere. Um, so that's useful for not just someone with a disability, but for people of all abilities and all ages when we're talking about you know, not making such a mess in the kitchen. Very few people even know that exists. So when we can start having more of those conversations, um, you think about our younger children who that could help in the kitchen, um, our aging folks who that could help. So it really does um, you know, really broaden things. There are a lot of different adaptive devices that go in the kitchen. Um, formerly, I was the director at the AT program in West Virginia, and we had an entire adapted kitchen as a demonstration space. Uh, and people were just amazed at how many adaptations you can make in a kitchen for folks with talking devices and devices to help you do things like pour or stir, um, able to you know, cut and chop things easier. So really um, there isn't much in the kitchen you can't do uh, with assistive technology. Now this last image here is a, a young child and a gate trainer at home. Um, one of the things I do like to tell folks is that um, you know, assistive technology can be really expensive. And when we're looking at something like this, this kid's gonna grow. Uh, as much as we sometimes hate to see it, they, we can't stop it, they will continue to grow. And this device is gonna cost anywhere from two to you know, $4,000 and they're gonna grow out of it. So we need to also be thinking about affordable ways that we can maybe recycle assistive technology so that folks can grow with it. Um, we do have a, a reuse program in Maine um, with um, Spurwink Alltech. So they run a reuse center out of Portland and it is for the whole state. But what that allows folks to do is, you know, should this child grow out of something, now they can donate it. And maybe there's another one there in a larger size that they can get access to. Um, so really creating a community of AT users that, you know, can empathize and we can utilize the equipment in a better way versus uh, her growing out of this equipment and then it just goes out in the garage where it collects dust and you know over time becomes unusable. Someone could have been having access to that and really um, utilizing it to increase their independence and increase their mobility. So again, um, AT is everywhere <laughs> and I'm talking a lot um, about a lot of different areas of AT and because I have an hour. So we're just going to kind of, we're really going into the deep end, but I'm going to give you these resources at the end so that you can contact to go deeper on specific things that are of interest to you. So I'm going to move on to school. Uh, assistive technology in school is, um, 
it's either a win or it's a fail. I, I just to be, to be blunt about it, you either have some really great folks that you're working with, some great special ed people who are understanding of assistive technology and the value of it, uh, and, or you don't. Um, and if you have to fight for it, uh, there are plenty of resources out there and we can be a resource for you in that as well. Uh, one of the biggest problems we have in Maine right now is that there is a, an extensive wait for an assistive technology evaluation. Um, so we know that a lot of uh, students in school who are waiting for assistive technology evaluations for their IEPs are well beyond the appropriate timeline. And this is because we don't have enough AT professionals in the state to provide these assessments. Um, so we are definitely working on that but it's something we have to push the envelope with. We really have to continue to fight for these services so they understand that they are valuable. Um, when we have a student, uh, just like this, the girl here on the left who is on a tablet with headphones on reading an audiobook. So she's getting text-to-speech, um, looking at her book, listening to her book. We have a lot of students who benefit from this and not just students with disabilities, um, different learning styles. But if you do have that disability and you do need that service, how far behind are you getting while you're waiting for that assessment? You know, everybody else is reading, they're taking the test, you're floundering because you just don't have the technology that you need. Um, so we wanna make sure our students are getting the technology they need in a timely manner so that they can stay up um, on the academic level with their peers. Uh, and a lot of this stuff now isn't super, uh, complicated. Uh, that tablet that she's using has all kinds of accessibility features built into it. Uh, there is no additional third-party app even or software that you have to install to do text-to-speech. It's built into the features that it will read the text aloud to you if you turn it on. So there's so much already built in that we just need to make sure we're educating and showing folks how to use that. Now, when we think about you know, universal design in schools, if all teachers would just deliver you know, our materials this way, then students would know they could turn it on and off on their own and anybody would have access to it. And that's something we're striving for. We've been striving for it for years, but we're gonna continue to fight for it, um, for folks to have that knowledge that you know, universal design should be there and students should have access to text-to-speech and things when they need it. Um, this girl in the middle is uh, typing with an adapted keyboard. So they've made a, a keyboard overlay on hers and it's um, dark letters on a yellow background. So I would say that she more than likely has a vision impairment, but there are a lot of different keyboard and typing options. Uh, one of the things that again, really bothers me is when we freely force kids to have to write with a pencil, um, we talk about handwriting and these things. Well, how often have you picked up a pencil and, and wrote anything lately? Uh, for the most part, we're all sitting here on computers and we're typing away. So why are we forcing some poor kid to cry his eyes out and hate school just because he can't write very well? Let's just move him on over to typing. You know, let's, let's be reasonable in our expectations and set kids up for success versus, you know, fighting and, and having failure. Um, when we do that, everyone's a lot happier. And when we say things like, oh, but it's not fair to Johnny who has to write. Well, guess what? Johnny can write. Um, so it's not fair to little Luke over here who can't write that he has to suffer and cry every day because this is miserable to him. Um, and really, if we're completing our science assignment, why do we care if it was written or if it was typed? I'm not graded on that. I'm graded on what I know, not you know, how I provided you my answers. So really getting that um, different modes of opportunity for them to express, um, uh, express themselves is really important. And there's so many ways to do it. If typing's not an option, well, you can do speech to text. That's built into everything now too. How often do we pick up our phones and hit the little microphone button and just say what we want to say versus having to type it out? You know, that option is there. And while some folks may say, oh, that's very disruptive in the classroom, guess what? There's technology for that. Um, there is a, a stenographer mask that they can put on that 
you can't hear outside of it. I could sit in there and talk all day, just like I'm talking right now. And no one around me would hear and it would be typing into my computer or my tablet. So there are ways to do things. It's just a matter of, instead of saying we can't, it's saying, how can we? Um, because when it comes to assistive technology, if there is a will, there is a way. Uh, the other uh, big thing uh, is communication devices, again, which is what this little boy over here on the right is working on. Uh, communication devices, again, um, school is where that really starts. Um, well, it should start earlier than that with, with our um, really little guys in birth to three. But uh, if they do not have a communication system when they're in school, uh, in K-12, there's problem. Um, <laughs> And, and that's just period, end of story, there's a problem. We can all communicate. If you tell me that someone doesn't have the ability to communicate, I will gladly argue with you um, because they're pointing, they're pulling you somewhere, they're you know, grunting about something, you know, you know, they are communicating, we are all communicating. They're just speaking a different language. So we just need, to get people transferred back over to our language, something we all understand. So we have to really uh, focus on, again, where that student is. And maybe they aren't at a place where they can use a communication device like this. Maybe they're at a place where we have to put objects Velcro to a wall and they have to go over and grab the cup that they drink out of to tell you that this is what, that they wanna drink. It's still better than them screaming because they can't tell you that they're thirsty. Um, so it's a better way to do it than not having a communication system. There is always a way to develop a communication system. And one of my big stories on communication is I had an aunt with Down syndrome um, and she was in the hospital for four months and she was uh, vented while awake. So she couldn't talk, but she wanted to talk. Um, and she couldn't tell me what she wanted. So of course, in the field that I'm in, I'm bringing every communication device I can find into the hospital to figure out you know, what's gonna work for her. Well, she was very, very weak. So pushing buttons was a really big struggle for her. And then also having to look at things because of the vent um, was a challenge. So I ended up uh, with just a iPad and I put on the paint app and she was using her finger uh, to write on it. And she said that she was talking about a dream and about the family farm. I would have never programmed that into any communication device I put in front of her. Think about that. How much do our individuals want to say that we don't even have programmed? Uh, so the more we can build communication, the more we could understand you know, the inner workings of the individuals around us, and they can have that ability to, to express what's going on with them. She'd been having nightmares about pigs at the farm. I can't comfort her when I don't know what we're, what we're working with. So communication is such an intense um, area for us to focus on. And then also when the doctors came in and were talking over her head and doing their morning rounds, she wrote on her device home. I said, did you want to ask them when you're going home? And she said, you know, she shook her head. Yes. Well, they started to walk out and I said, excuse me, Bobby has a question. And they said, well, she doesn't talk. And I said, I turned my board around and said, she just asked when she's going home. From there on out, her care completely changed. From there on out, they talked to her and they explained things to her. So we that day communicated to the entire hospital and <laughs> that regardless of the person's ability you think they have, you need to be talking to them and letting them have a voice in their care. So that went off school a little bit, but we're going to go into work now. Um, employment is such a, a valuable thing, and we really are moving into much more inclusive employment options. Uh, there are so many different ways that we can work now. Uh, and with COVID, it really opened up a lot of eyes too on you know, our different work environments. Do you really have to be in an office? You know, if you have uh, a disability that makes you a little less social and gives you some social anxiety, uh, can you work from home and still do your work? 
is it possible? It really has opened a lot of doors for us. Um, and then the technology that's available to do those different things. Um, so everything from, again, you know, being able to communicate to, honestly, if you have a, a vision impairment, there are so many pieces of technology out there um, that can read things aloud to you, that can help you navigate uh, an office space. Um, you know, if it's a low vision that can enlarge the print, uh, just like this uh, gentleman here who's in a wheelchair, who's welding, there are devices even that would hold the welder for him if he had one hand so that he could bring his, um, whatever he's welding into it. So, he, and to be able to turn it and do things with it. So there's a lot of different options out there. So when we start talking about work, it shouldn't be about, oh, where can I work? But, okay, this is what I want to do. What tools do I need to be able to do that independently? Uh, you know, and you know, for those individuals who maybe need a little bit more uh, support at work, there are ways to now back off on some of that person-to-person uh, -person support and make it a, you know, either low tech. Um, if they need to have um, you know step-by-step -step guide to remind them how to do things, well, we can do that without a person standing there. Uh, we can do that through pictures, or we can have, you know, apps that, you know, can do step-by-step -step guides with videos and pictures. And so you can have it read aloud to you so you can hear it and see it. So there's so many different ways that we can make sure that folks can continue uh, to work and, and give back. Um, most of the folks I know don't want to stay home because they have a disability. They want to be a part of life and, and be a contributor to society. It's just a matter of making sure they have the avenues to do that. I would say the biggest barrier to work is not the employees, it's the employers and not understanding how many adaptations can be low cost or no cost, how easy it is for us to include folks with disabilities in work through various technologies. Um, many of the technologies that would make work accessible are low cost or not, no cost at all. There's a lot of text-to-speech software that doesn't cost anything. Um, and a lot of the times our folks are going to be coming in with their own technology. So their communication devices, um, you know, their mobility aids, things that the employer doesn't even need to, to provide any extra support for. So when we are, again, looking at work, it's not about what, you know, what can we do, but what do we want to do? And everybody has the right to pursue a career that is enjoyable and fulfilling to them. You know, and there's the technology and different tools out there available to make that happen. And community. You know, we all want to be involved in our community. And uh, I have a picture here of an adaptive playground. Um, and one of my, my plugs on adaptive playgrounds is those are not just for children. Um, when we have an accessible playground, that means that even adults with disabilities can now take their children to the playground. Um, we have a lot of grand families now uh, at, who are raising grandkids. So they can now use their walker to get to the swings and help push their kid, their grandchild on the swings if it's an accessible playground. Um, here we have um, an adaptive playground uh, with a special swing on it so that someone who cannot hold themselves up in a swing can still swing. I am a huge advocate for accessible playgrounds. I cannot imagine a world where everyone doesn't get the opportunity to feel the wind in their face when they're swinging. Um, every child should get to have that experience of that flying through the air. It's just such a, a, a wonderful childhood moment. Um, so I do encourage, you know, as you're seeing changes in your communities and people are fundraising for uh, playgrounds and things to really look at adaptive playgrounds um, or accessible playgrounds so that we're having surfaces that people can get around on so that we can have a more inclusive, inclusive community and a, and a more welcoming environment for everyone. Uh, the other picture I have here is a man coming down the steps, not the steps, the steps are covered in a portable ramp. <laughs> He could have come down the steps. It would have been a very ugly <laughs> end of things for him. But uh, so this portable ramp folds up so it's, he can take it different places. 
right now we don't have a ramp program in Maine. Uh, that is something I'm working on. So probably within the next year, we'll have um, some portable ramps that we'll be loaning out uh, because unfortunately, especially when we're talking about where we live here in New England, it's older places, older buildings, older homes, and there's a lot of accessibility issues. Um, it's unfortunate. It is, it's just the nature of where we live. Uh, but there are ways to make things accessible. So um, for us to continue to access our communities, we do have a, you know, a, a large body of people here in Maine who are looking at you know, um, the aging in place factors and in, you know, uh, aging communities to ensure accessibility. Well, that's accessibility across the board for all ages, but they're still gonna wanna go visit people or go do things that may not be accessible to you. Having a portable ramp system is awesome. However, there is a, you know, the one issue with portable ramps is they're only so long in order for them to be portable. Uh, the longest portable ramp that they have is a 10 foot ramp um, that you can try fold. So you end up with like a five foot uh, suitcase ramp that you're carrying around, but at least it'll fit in your car. The ADA code though for ramps is for every inch of height, you need a foot of width. Um, so most steps are somewhere between four and six inches. So to get up one step, you're probably going to need a six foot ramp uh, in order to meet ADA codes. So there's some finesse that must be done there, um, but it can be done. And it's just a matter of being creative. And you know we want that though, so that folks can be able to access their communities. And one area of community that is very important to access is like our community shelters. So should there be an emergency um, and we need to go to community shelters, they should be accessible by law, but if they're not, you know, they need to be having things like a ramp, a portable ramp that's available um, or, or some other uh, avenue for you to get into those shelters. So definitely making sure that anything in your environment that you might need in an emergency um, is fully accessible to you is really important and recreation, um, which is one of my favorite things that people tend to leave off. Uh, we all focus so much on, can you get dressed and take care of yourself? Can you manage your medication? Can you go to school and can you learn? Can you work? Okay, your life is done. But it's not, I go to work, so, well, okay, I love what I do. So granted, I get paid to do something I love, which is wonderful, but it also pays me to go do things then that I enjoy. I get to go to concerts. I get to travel. I get to go and um, you know, ride bikes and kayak. I get to enjoy my life. We need to make sure that when we are talking to individuals with disabilities about assistive technology, we're also making, you know, letting them know that there's technology for recreation as well. Um, life doesn't end, you know, after school. It doesn't end after work. You can still find a lot of things out there that you enjoy. Um, you know, we have an individual here who's uh, in a wheelchair and he's you know, playing baseball uh, with a, a beach ball and a, and a large bat. Uh, and our second picture is an adapted bicycle uh, where we see a dad, it's, it's a two-person bicycle, the dad's on the back and the front is an individual with a, a disability and his leg braces. You know, he may not have been able to ride a bike on his own, but now he can have access to the community and be a part of that. Um, and then here on the other end, we have a, a child in a stander and it looks like she's in a, a she's on a playground with a sand, um, in a sand kind of box area. Uh, and she's able to stand up and she's putting sand in her buckets, something she wouldn't be able to do without having that equipment out there on the playground. So, you know, just finding what people want to be able to do and, and figuring that out. I was working with a gentleman um, who he was a rafting guide and he had a spinal cord injury. So um, his rafting, you know, got limited. So we were looking at different ways he could still go out there and be a whitewater rafter. Uh, and they have this amazing device called a creature craft. That's a huge inflatable raft that's basically untippable. And it had all the harness points for him to be able to strap into um, and be able to still enjoy what he wanted to do. It was just a matter of researching and figuring out what was out there. That creature craft is not designed for folks with disabilities. It's just there for folks who want to raft and are afraid of tipping over. 
Um, so here's this crazy, amazing device, but it can be used for lots of people. Um, the same thing with kayaking, um, you know, there's adapted kayaking seats and, you know, different kinds of devices so that help you get into the kayak. Um, so really it is again, finding what people want to do and, and just getting the resources put in place. Um, and also giving them the ability to really explore things they want to be able to do. Because a lot of times folks don't realize that things are even an option. Uh, I worked with a gentleman who didn't realize his son could ride a bike. Um, you know, if we had the right type of bicycle for him that provided all the supports for him so that he could be upright in the bicycle. Once we put the kid in the bike, the dad and him were just absolutely ecstatic that now they could do family trips on the, on the bike trail. Um, they just didn't know it was available. So just making sure, you know, folks understand that we can still try things out. There are things out there. If there is a will, there's a way. Um, so a little bit about the state assistive technology program. So this is uh, every state has one of these programs. So I'm talking to you about it, but if you have family, you know, in Washington or Texas, every state in U.S. territory has one of these programs, and they're all free uh, for individuals to use. They provide device demonstrations, uh, device loans. Uh, every state has a device reuse program. They do information and assistance, and they do training. So what does all of that like really look like, well, a device demonstration is like, say you know that you need a magnifier, you just don't know what you need. Then you call one of our, you, you call the state AT program and you say, this is my situation. And you know, they'll set up a time with you to look at some different magnifiers, compare features, have the conversations of what do you wanna be able to do with it? Um, where are you gonna be using it? Uh, cause if you need something portable, then, you know, we're not going to look at some large CCTV kind of thing that has to sit on a desk. So they'll have those conversations to help you make an educated and informed decision. Um, now the device loans is the next step of that. So there's a lot of different equipment, um, that they can loan out for a short-term loan period. So it's usually like 30 to 60 days where you can try it in your environment because you can try something in a clinic and it works great. You think it's wonderful, but when you actually go home and try to you know, use it in your environment, does it work for you there? Um, you know, maybe it's too big for the area that you're wanting to utilize it in, or the lighting isn't great. I know we, I've done a communication assessment with an individual and we chose eye gaze communication. The system was fantastic. He did great with it. We got it home and the lighting in his home was not good enough to really pick up his eyes and do an eye scan. So here we are with a $16,000 device that wasn't really going to be usable. Um, so really getting to try that in your environment is extremely helpful. Uh, and that's also a great way too, is when, when we're looking at employment, is when we're exploring employment options, being able to borrow devices to use in those employment places to show first the employer that these are options and are available and also to give access um, so that an individual can do a job that otherwise maybe they didn't think they could. So they're a really great tool and to help decide if this is the tool for you, but then also decide if you know these different activities are things you wanna do like work or recreational activities. Now, our device reuse program I mentioned previously uh, is where you know, people can donate um, equipment that is, you know, gently used or, um, you know, someone has passed away. Bye-bye. Hang on just a second. Okay, I think we got it now. Um, so... When someone passes away or maybe you did buy that piece of equipment that you're like it's not really what i wanted it's not working for me um being able to pass that on to somebody else who can use it um and that's a great way for us to really give back to the community we all know that it's already a big enough challenge to have a disability and now when we start looking at purchasing equipment for folks we have to pay to have a disability too uh, so if we can help cut that cost for people, I think it's just a really great way for us as a uh, disability community to give back. 
uh, one of the ways I have used the reuse program is I've had uh, multiple foot surgeries and I needed a knee scooter so that I could continue to get around and, and do my job. I wasn't going to need it on a long-term permanent basis. So I was able to get that from a reuse center, utilize it. And when I didn't need it anymore, I got to give it back. Um, so it's great for those short-term accommodations and short-term disabilities as well. Um, additionally, not sure what just happened on my screen. Um, <laughs> um, it's your assistive technology revolting against you. <laughs> apparently it is. It's possessed. <laughs> uh, one of the things we are working on here, though, in Maine is to increase our reuse. Um, we have the reuse center. Um, All tech has it down in Portland. Of course, Portland's not centrally located. Uh, it's very challenging for a lot of our folks um, to get down there to pick up things or drop things off. Um, we are trying to get funding for a mobile assistive technology lab, which would be a, like a box truck and that we could take around the state. And in that we could also be picking up equipment and dropping equipment off to people. So that's something that we're hoping in the next year or two that we're gonna be able to provide. Uh, additionally, we do information and assistance. So if you just don't know what you need or you're just confused about assistive technology or you just there's something you really want to be able to do and you don't know how to make this happen, you can give us a call. And that's the, our job is to, to walk you through that and give you some information and um, you know, try to point you in the right direction. And then we also do trainings like this. We do a lot of community trainings, do trainings for um, individuals, um, you know, for school systems. I just did a training for senior centers the other day. So, you know, lots of different training opportunities. Um, okay, let's see what's happening now. Okay. Oh, yep, okay. Um, and we serve all ages and all abilities. So there is no... Um, qualifications to receive our services. As long as you live in Maine and you're breathing, we'll work with you. Um, if you live in New Hampshire and you're breathing, we'll refer you to the New Hampshire program. If you're not breathing, we just really don't have much assistance to provide to you, um, but we wish your family well. Um, but we work with everybody. So even an individual who is a provider or maybe just somebody who's interested in exploring assistive technology, they can borrow devices from us or ask us questions. Um, I know like we have adapted uh, mouse options and keyboard options. So maybe it's just somebody who's like, is there a more ergonomic mouse that I could use because my wrist is starting to hurt? They can use the program too. Um, if it's a service provider who says, you know, one of my, you know, one of my kids at school is you know, starting to utilize this kind of a device. Do you have one that I can use so I can get familiar with it too? Uh, that's what the program is for. It's there for all ages, all abilities, as long as you live here in the state. I really don't know where the scribbles came from. Um, I'm just going to roll with it. <laughs> and it's like I was talking before, all areas of life. Uh, so all walks of life can contact us and, and we'll work with them um, and their service providers, you know, their educators, whoever it is on their team to try to get them pointed in the right direction. So our partners here in Maine are Spurwink Alltech. Um, they're down in Portland. The, the Pine Tree Society, which is, they have one office in Bath and they have a couple of other offices as well. Uh, UMaine Farmington also has a loan library and Galant Therapy Services does demonstrations and loans as well. So all of the partners you see here do uh, equipment demonstrations and equipment loans. Uh, Spurwink Alltech also does our reuse program. So you can contact any of those guys and ask them for uh, more information about those. And I'm gonna show you our AT for main website here in just a moment. So here are a few of the trainings that we have done recently. Um, like we've done a training for you know, students with dyslexia, smart home technologies, uh, Farming Smarter with Assistive Technology, AT for Brain Injury, um, AT for Your Life, Tools for Independence, uh, AT Services for Blind and Low Vision in Maine. We have an upcoming training that might be of interest to, the, to this crowd, um, talking about transition across the lifespan and adding transition to our assistive technology consideration. Uh, so that's going to be March 31st, and it's from 4 to 5. Uh, at the end of this, you'll see our website. And so you just go to the website and go to the trainings and you can register for the training there. But that's just really going to cover 
how we need to be thinking about assistive technology as we transition. And that's not just from school to life, that's everywhere. Um, that's from job to job, from place, you know, apartment to um, home, from hospital to home. There are a lot of different transitions that we're facing all the time. So there is a lot of different things we need to be thinking about when we th think about considering assistive technology devices. Uh, other things we do work on with folks is assist accessible materials. So, you know, our websites need to be accessible. Our uh, materials that we're putting out there need to be accessible for folks with different abilities. So we help folks uh, make sure that their materials and their correspondence is accessible. So we do do trainings on that um, and have discussions on that. So now if you are curious about assistive technology, the AT for Maine website is the inventory of all the assistive technology that we have available for loan and demonstration in Maine. Um, so atformaine.org. And you can create a username and you can go in and you can surf through everything that is available. You can contact um, the organization that has that piece of equipment, or you can just request it straight from the website. You don't even have to talk to anyone. Um, but once you request it, someone will contact you to talk about how we're going to get it to you and the different parameters of the, the loan program for that organization. So it's a great way, though, just to surf through and see what's available. Um, but be mindful, that is not all the assistive technology that is available in the world. Who knows how many things have come out in the last hour that I've been talking to you. Um, that is one of the things about assistive technology between apps and technology and all of these things, new stuff is coming out all the time. Um, so what an assistive technology person does really is we're a professional problem solver. I know the basis of what assistive technology is available. Now I'm going to work with the person to figure out the specifics of what they need. And then I'm going to go do the research to make sure I'm pairing the person with the right device. Um, so our loan library inventory gives you some of that base knowledge, you know, what's out there and different things to try. Uh, there's a lot of different adapted farm and garden equipment on there um, from our agribility program, um, adapted gaming controller. So there's just a lot of different stuff available. So here is our contact information. Um, main Mainsite.org is our website. Our phone number is also listed along with the uh, email address for the organization, and then my personal email address. And while you're copying all that down, if you need to copy it down, this is also going to be available to you. Um, I also wanted to say one last thing about resources. Funding is probably one of the hardest things that we come across with assistive technology, but there are funding sources. A lot of it's dried up with COVID because we have um, had some narrowing of what people need to, what different federal sources and things want to fund, such as, um, you know, combating social isolation. So we're seeing a lot of tablets being funded um, and things like that for telemedicine, which has taken funding from other um, potential activities. The other thing we've noticed is a lot of our small nonprofits like Lions Clubs and community organizations haven't been able to do the fundraising that they would normally get to do. So, uh, a lot of times if we can't find any other funding, we'll talk to community organizations to see if they can help us fund AT. You know, that's a little bit more of a challenge right now, but there are resources out there. You know, we can talk to you about, you know, should the school be funding that assistive technology? Should the employer be funding that assistive technology? You know, these are some grants that are available. Uh, one thing that is available through um, Alpha One is a low interest revolving loan. It's less than 4% for a monetary loan for assistive technology. So we can help point you in the direction uh, to get to those resources as well. So I know that that was a lot, um, but I just tried to cover assistive technology across the lifespan with all ages and all abilities um, in an hour. So if you have questions, shout them out. If there's something specific that you're interested in, um, also shout that out. We'll you know, put a training together and let you know uh, when, we, when we can offer that. So uh, I open the floor for conversation. Thank you, Jessica. If anybody has any questions, please feel free to unmute yourself and ask, or you can use the chat box. I also want to note that Jessica will share the PowerPoint with me and I will add it to the recording on our website. So you will have access to that material as well. Um, are there any questions that anybody has? 
I just want to respond really quick here to Kat um, um, about uh, your chat message. I'm going to read it aloud to everyone so you know what I'm responding to. It says, we're working through some communication device issues with my son. He has CAS. He also had a service-related issue where his whole class and school signed with him, but the rest of the world doesn't. And Kat, this is a problem that we run into a lot. Um, it's that barrier that sign language is a wonderful thing when you have the people around you who also speak your language. Um, but when we get out into the community, it can really, uh, it can be frustrating because you have gone from an environment where your language is accepted and it can really grow to a place where no one can talk to you. Um, but the value here is that your child has learned the value of language. So they're gonna pick up other de devices probably a lot faster because they know that if they can communicate, things are gonna come faster to them and life's just gonna run a little bit smoother. Uh, but yeah, you are absolutely right. When it comes to sign language, it, it is a challenge. Um, but if you have communication device issues that I can help you with, I would be happy to talk to you about them. Thanks, I appreciate that. I've actually, um, I saw you at the autism conference too. Oh, that's so right. We already yeah. chatted, <laughs> um, yes. but right now he's just on a waiting list. And with the communication device, so like you were saying, when it has to stay at school, he could go through CDS, but then it would have to stay at school. And school is not the issue. <laughs> it's the rest of the world, which puts us in a not CDS, but the med model. And it all gets so confusing sometimes. I don't know if like maybe that's a training that would be really helpful is like, and I don't know if that's you or somebody else, but like when do I go through CDS? When do I go through medical model? What's the difference? What do I do on my own? What do I ask for help with? I think maybe attending the transition um, uh, training might be beneficial because it talks a lot about who purchases this device. So when does it carry with you? Uh, who, you know, how does that work? What do you need to be considering when you're thinking about those things? Because when you're considering AT, who purchases the device is a big deal. If it's the school, they have the ability to say it stays here. Um, and if it's you, you know, then they may say, oh, well, we don't want your expensive device coming to school. What if it gets broken? Uh, so there's conversations to be had there. And that's a, there's a lot of um, research that's gone into those conversations that you know, we can help you have those conversations. Sometimes you're just battling, um, unfortunately, the people on the other side of the table more than the technology or anything else. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so there's an education piece we need to add there. Definitely. Um, the other training that I was going to suggest is we have a teacher with my um, other child who has a lot of sensory processing and we have the most incredible teacher this year that like I could ever ask for. Um, and she has done so many things in her classroom. But every time I come back to her and I say, oh, I heard this. Oh, and I found this. She's so interested. So I'm wondering if there's like a call for a teacher's classroom sensory adaptation kind of thing. Or maybe that's already out there and I just don't know it. It is not out there and you don't know it, or at least to my knowledge. Um, one of the things that I am working with the Department of Education now is to develop an AT boot camp for educators mm -hmm. so that those who are interested and, you know, ready to go. They just need that extra, you know, they, they just need the resource to get them there. Um, that I'm hoping to get that up and running within the next year. That's awesome. So you let them know though, if they have questions, they can contact me. Obviously I love what I do. I will yes. be happy to share with them all that information that I can. I will. I'll definitely let her know. It's very clear that you love your, what you do, Jessica. Thank you so much for your or Jesse, I know, sorry. I'm reading like the Zoom name because my brain is shot after um, a day of Zoom meetings. Um, but I, I um, thank you so much for being here today and, and providing us with this wealth of knowledge. Um, I understand that it's a lot coming at families, um, but we'll, you know, we'll provide you with the PowerPoint as well. And, and if you guys have questions, you know, you'll have Jesse's contact, but if for some reason you forget, um, you give a, you give me a parent federation or call, we'll get you in touch with Insight as well. We, we refer people there all the time. 
So um, not seeing any more questions in the chat. So I um, wanna honor everybody's time. It is five o'clock. Um, I wanna thank everybody for joining us um, for all of our sessions today. If you've been able to join us um, or the sessions that you've been able to join, I hope you've been enjoyed it. Um, it's been a wealth of knowledge for, for me today and um, I've enjoyed everybody's presence and participation. So thank you so much. And I hope uh, you enjoy the 60 degrees on Friday. Although Robin, I see you're on here. It's probably not gonna be 60 quite up there, but enjoy the warmer weather um, and pray for no more snow. Everybody enjoy the rest of your week and thank you for joining us.